Hello everyone, good morning and good afternoon based on your location. Uh, my name is Timea Krofony and I'm the new member of uh, the EAIS team and it's my great pleasure to welcome you with the second interview of 2020 and we have some uh, maybe exciting news for you. Uh, because from now on, we will meet under the new name of our interviews, the EAIS Talks on uh, Israel Studies. And also, under these talks, we would like to promote and support emerging scholars and uh, young researchers by presenting their papers and their work. And if you are interested to be part of the series, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. And as a part of this new expanding concept of our series, please uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Jonathan Gariani. Uh, hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Timia. <laughs> Glad uh, to be here. We are very happy to have you here. <laughs> and uh, I will just briefly introduce you and then the floor will be yours. Um, Dr. Uh, Gariani completed his PhD in 2020 in Hebrew and Jewish studies at the University College London and his dissertation thesis was focused on the Middle East peace process through a comparative analysis of the diplomatic history of the bilateral and multilateral peace negotiations from 2000 until today. Previously, he studied uh, security and diplomacy at the Tel Aviv University and also at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya, uh, Israel. And today uh, we will talk about his paper, uh, Israel and Morocco from a clandestine partnership to the Abraham Accords, which was issued by the Israeli Institute, Institute of Israeli Studies of Concordia, uh, university. Uh, so Dr. Gariani, again, we are very happy that you are here with us today. And I already spoke a bit about your academic background. So maybe could you tell us from where are you joining us today and what are you working on currently? Hey, thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction, Timia. Uh, I'm still working for the Israeli Institute of uh, Israeli Studies at Concordia University. And I am based currently in Israel. I'm, conduct I'm conducting all of my research online uh, as a non-resident uh, scholar. Mm -hmm. And uh, currently I'm uh, working on a project on Turkey-Israel relations. I'm writing an article on that subject. I'm um, mm -hmm. covering the period from 1996 to uh, 2018. So uh, basically from when Israel established a uh, strategic partnership with Turkey up came to power in 2002, uh, up until the Navi Marmar incidents, which uh, uh, actually led to the deterioration of ties between Israel and Turkey. Uh, I'm also assisted by my research assistant, uh, Lea Adoni, who are working uh, BA students uh, at uh, Concordia University in political science, a fourth year student. And uh, together with uh, Lea, we are working on this project, and I'm very grateful for her assistance. I'm also very grateful for uh, Dr. for Professor Chaba Nicolini, uh, support uh, from the Israel Institute. Uh, I'm very grateful for, for his help and encouragement and as advice as well. So uh, that's uh, yeah, that's mainly this. I'm working. I'm very busy with this project, but I'm also uh, working on a second project, which is to convert my uh, PhD thesis into a formal book. Mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, also taking a lot, of, a lot, a lot of time. But this research is fascinating, and I'm very delighted to uh, to work on this project to be able to uh, uh, convert it into a monograph. Is indeed uh, a very important um, a milestone in my research, in my academic career. Uh, that's amazing. So fingers crossed for uh, for your book. Uh, we are very delighted that you are working on that and uh, looking forward to it. Um, so maybe let's get to the to the paper itself and get some background of it. Um, uh, is this is the paper the um, the result of your dissertation or is the continuation of the focus of your doctoral studies? 
or uh, what was the main impulse or motivation to write it? Well, actually, it's a combination of factors. Uh, first of all, as you mentioned, my um, uh, PhD research influenced my decision to write this paper as the two subjects are very close, very uh, connected. Uh, as you mentioned, I wrote my uh, PhD thesis on the comparative analysis of the bilateral and multilateral uh, approach, approach to the peace process. And uh, a portion of my uh, PhD thesis focuses on the rapprochement between Israel and the Arab states, which took place from 2015 to uh, up to the Abraham Accords. And this, uh, this research definitely uh, uh, pushed me into writing this uh, memorandum or paper, or occasional paper, on, on uh, Israel relations with Morocco. The second uh, factor is my uh, work at the Midvim Institute on um, Israeli regional foreign policy under the supervision of uh, Dr. Niamh Goran, who encouraged me to write this paper. And I'm also very grateful for his advice. Um, when I was conducting my research at uh, the Midvim Institute, I um, built a database of um, uh, materials and, uh, and uh, entries on uh, cooperation between Israel and the Arab states, uh, on the Arab states, which took place from uh, early 2015 to late 2019, so the period prior to the Alabama Accords, and uh, it covered actually a lot of interactions between Israel um, and the Arab states, for instance, meetings between former Saudi and Israeli officials, uh, security cooperations uh, that were emerging between Israel and the Gulf states. Some were uh, covered, not made pub publicly available. Others were more public. Uh, it could be about sports, co uh, sports cooperation, for instance, Israeli team attending a competition uh, in the UAE or in Qatar before we established relations with the UAE. So this, my, this research actually significantly influenced my decision to write uh, this uh, paper on Morocco Israel relations. And I've also forgot to add that I will um, have another paper published, which is similar on uh, Oman-Israel relations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is also a very interesting case that I would like to uh, discuss it later when, uh, uh, when we have discussion on the Morocco-Israel uh, Israel relations paper. Yeah, maybe maybe we will be able we will see uh, how how much time it uh, will take to get uh, through yeah. this paper, this current paper. But maybe we will have a few minutes to discuss or um, the important parts of the uh, yeah. of this relations uh, as well. So we will see. Uh, and uh, maybe um, in your paper, you uh, trace the development and changes in uh, relations between Israel and Morocco since 1960s, from those clandestine ties and cooperation to more official and more formal ones. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe could you, uh, could you give us an overview of uh, the main milestones or pivotal moments of the mutual cooperation and it would be great if you can mention also not just the positive examples of the cooperation mm -hmm. but maybe also the moments of certain rapture and reasons behind them. Sure so I will start actually with the beginning when uh, Israel and Morocco established clandestine relations via the Mossad in 1963. Uh, the two architects who were behind these relations, this uh, back channel uh, ties between Israel and Morocco, uh, were Mir Amit, who is the head of the Mossad, was actually at the time the head of the Mossad, and his Moroccan counterparts, uh, General Ufkir, Mohamed Ufkir, who uh, was the head of uh, Moroccan intelligence uh, services. Um, and these two indeed uh, paved the way for. Uh, uh, the relations between uh, Morocco and, um, and Israel. And during this period of time, Israel and Morocco cooperated um, in the field of security, mainly in the field of security. For instance, Israel provided uh, all forms of military assistance from armed sales. Uh, Israel provided uh, tanks and light rifles to, uh, to Morocco, which was unprecedented as Israel uh, never provided military assistance to uh, an Arab states in, in before that, even, clan uh, even uh, clandestinely. Um, also military intelligence, I mean, uh, both countries cooperated in the field of intelligence. Uh, Israel pro provided training to uh, military, to Moroccan military personnel, including uh, tank crews, but also um, train um, Moroccan MiG-17 pilots in the arts of uh, air, air warfare and air combat. 
Um, so this cooperation was indeed, I would say, the first uh, pivotal moment um, uh, mm -hmm. between uh, uh, Morocco and Israel. Um, the second moment, which is uh, important, is uh, when indeed uh, Morocco joined the uh, Yom Kippur War, the Arab coalition against Israel during the Yom Kippur War, which led to, uh, uh, to I would say, uh, um, a temporary moment, uh, a temporary halt in the relations between Morocco and Israel. Mm -hmm. But uh, this did not last long, as uh, in 1977, this is actually, I think, the most important um, element of the Moroccan-Israeli relations. Um, King Hassan uh, II invited uh, Moshe Dayan and uh, Hassan al tuami Moshe Dayan was at the time the um, Israeli foreign minister and Hassan al tuami was Egyptian uh, uh, vice premier for uh, secret uh, negotiations, secret talks in Marrakesh. Now this is actually very important as in the past they, uh, no, no negotiations or talks uh, occurred between Egypt and Israel, mm -hmm. both countries were in a state of war, and the official Arab position was uh, no negotiations, no uh, recognition, and no peace, the so-called three no's at the Khartoum summit. Uh, and Morocco actually was breaking a taboo uh, by uh, not only facilitating, but allowing the two sides to discuss the terms of a peace treaty, uh, what will it entails, what will be the, uh, the depth of Israeli withdrawal versus the normalization. All this were for the first time discussed between these two um, leaders, uh, Moshe Dayan and Hassan al tuami for the first time. And this is indeed, I think, a major milestone, which mm -hmm. demonstrates, I would say, the uh, independent foreign policy of Morocco, which, uh, which stand in contrast with the Arab states. Um, and um, these uh, negotiations, these back channel negotiations was important uh, as it might have actually led uh, Sadat, it might have convinced Sadat uh, that uh, Begin, Menachem Begin, was an Israeli prime minister, was a serious partner in uh, in, in peace, and that um, he should make his bold move and visit Jerusalem uh, on November 19, 1977. I do believe that these uh, backshell negotiations played a major role in that endeavor. And King Hassan mm -hmm. actually went even further. He proposed to have a meeting to invite both Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat to Marrakesh, provided that Menachem Begin would commit to a full withdrawal from the territories, from all the, uh, the occupied territories. Mm -hmm. But of course, it did not happen as Israel uh, at the time was committed to uh, greater Israel. It, it, Begin was willing to withdraw from Sinai, but not from all the territories. So the meeting did not happen, but for a different reason, the, 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 the talks between uh, between uh, e Egypt and Israel, these secret negotiations were leaked in the press, in the Israeli press, and therefore um, uh, theorists about the leaks, uh, Hassan decided to cancel uh, further, ne further um, back channel negotiations, even though they would be resumed in, in December 1977 after Sadat visit to Jerusalem. So there were two meetings, two back channel negotiations uh, under the auspices of uh, uh, King Hassan. Now, the third pivotal moment, um, I would say, is when um, Prime Minister Shimon Peres visited uh, Morocco um, for the first time as an official uh, capacity. There, uh, in the past, there were some Israeli leaders, as I've mentioned, Moshe Dayan, but also Yitzhak Rabin, and even Shimon Peres himself, who made secret visit to, uh, to Morocco, but these were not official visits. This was the first time that an Israeli leader was invited by um, an Arab leader other than Egypt. Egypt uh, indeed visited Israel, uh, so that visited Israel in uh, 1977 and um, invited Menachem Begin uh, subsequently. But it, other than Egypt, it was the first Arab, Arab leader to invite uh, an Israeli leader for uh, a, a summit in, uh, in Morocco, which took place in Ifran, not in Rabat. Uh, even though the two sides have some divergences on the peace process and on um, Israel position vis-a-vis -vis the PLO, uh, this was very symbolic historic of, and of historical proportion. Uh, and uh, the third moment I would add is, um, sorry, the fourth moment, fourth uh, pivotal <laughs> moment. <laughs> uh, sorry too, for this confusion. Too, too many, too many milestones. <laughs> Uh, I would say is the uh, Middle East uh, North Africa um, conventional summit in um, Casablanca on, on economic cooperation, which again underscored 
uh, King Hassan ability to uh, facilitate between the between the sides. It was the first time that Arab leaders and Israeli leaders talk about potential business cooperation. As in the past, um, Arab states have been reluctant to, to even spoke about normalization with Israel. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they could talk about abrogating the uh, Arab boycotts, uh, the Gulf states abrog abrogated part of the Arab boycotts, mainly the secondary and tertiary part of uh, the boycott, um, mm -hmm. demonstrates that uh, this was actually a new Middle East in the uh, in, in, in the, uh, emerging. And uh, King Hassan actually was really uh, played an important part in this. Now the fifth, um, no, the, sorry, the, the, the fifth um, pivotal moment is when Morocco established formal dip diplomatic ties with Israel. Even though these ties were not um, full diplomatic relations, it was still important to, uh, for Morocco to demonstrate that uh, in contrast to other Arab states, they are willing to make um, that move. They are willing to uh, uh, make efforts in the uh, and pave the way for normalization with Israel. Tourism increased significantly during this time. There were even uh, further security cooperation again under the radar, but still uh, um, possible, still very much uh, likely to happen. And um, uh, now the sixth, and this is unfortunately a, a negative uh, pivotal mm -hmm. moment, is when Morocco broke relations with Israel. In, on September 28th, 2000. Uh, and uh, this uh, moment was uh, indeed, I think, uh, a major negative negative element in the uh, relations between Morocco and Israel, as many many things have been established, many things have been accomplished over during the Oslo, during the Oslo period. And uh, this, this rupture actually uh, was extremely negative, even though the two sides were, uh, still cooperated uh, covertly mm -hmm. and cooperation remained active. And eventually, relations would be restored um, when President Trump uh, uh, announced the, uh, that Morocco joined the Abraham Accords on December 2000 and restored uh, the, the relations that have been uh, severed uh, during the Second Intifada. Um, and what do you see as the main reasons that led Morocco to establish and maintain a relations with Israel in contrast to uh, to other Arab states throughout the years? Because, for example, as you mentioned, the the presence of Mossad in uh, during the 60s in Morocco, mm -hmm. uh, it's a huge step and it was uh, agreed or official from the side uh, of the king, right? So could you please uh, tell us your, your point of view? So... Um... Actually, Morocco, Mar uh, the uh, the reasons why Morocco established clandestine relations with Israel in the first place is due to the, due to um, a common threats from Algeria and Egypt. Mm -hmm. Egypt supported um, Algeria, which which had some conflict with uh, with Morocco, uh, the so-called sand war. Both Algeria and uh, and Morocco went to war, and Egypt supported um, Algerian military efforts against uh, Morocco. So, that, so they needed support uh, from France, but also from Israel in their um, in their um, uh, efforts to uh, to bolster the security and defense against uh, a potential uh, Algerian aggression. And mm -hmm. therefore, they needed to uh, to get um, Israeli support, who was willing to 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 help Morocco, given the fact that uh, they also saw Egypt. Uh, Israel, so both Egypt and Algeria as a threat to the security as well. So mm -hmm. both sides, in fact, um, have converging interests, which is uh, very much um, uh, similar to the situation today, not only with Morocco, as we still have um, uh, converging interests with Morocco over Algeria and Iran today, but also with between the UAE and, Is uh, and Israel, between Bahrain and Israel. Uh, the, the reasons why the Obama Accords were signed and why um, the, uh, these, emerging these ties are emerging between Israel and even blossoming between Israel and the Gulf states is due to a common, uh, due to a, a common threat, which is the uh, Iranian threat, the, not only the Iranian nuclear program, but also its uh, uh, involvement in the regions uh, and its uh, nefarious activities within the Middle East. This uh, brought uh, Israel and the Arab states together, and this is, it is the same reason that led to um, uh, to the establishment of clandestine relations between Israel uh, and Morocco in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, the second reason, I think, is also due to the fact that uh, uh, King Hassan always wanted to uh, promote peaceful relations between Israel and the Arab states, mm -hmm. uh, as, as it is demonstrated by his uh, willingness to facilitate discussions uh, between Egypt and Israel in 1977, as we've discussed uh, 
before. Um, yeah, I think these are, these are the main reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this uh, a strategic issue of security maybe leads me to another question because in your paper, uh, you um, multiple times you mentioned uh, so-called uh, alliance of periphery and mm -hmm. um, you see the Morocco-Israeli connection during 60s as the extension of uh, this doctrine and maybe for the wider audience uh, who are not experts on this topic, could you please explain this doctrine and uh, say um, which strategic steps maybe uh, let Israel to adopt it or uh, extend it to, to Morocco as sure. well? And you already yeah. somehow covered it a bit, a bit but uh, if you could mm -hmm. elaborate on that. Yes, so the doctrine of the periphery was um, um, a policy put forward by David Ben-Gurion uh, who posited the idea of establishing uh, close relations with non-Muslim states in the region, for instance, Iran and Turkey. Iran before, of course, the uh, Iranian revolution when the Shah was in, uh, was in power, but also Turkey, given the fact that there were converging interests over Syria, both um, Turkey and uh, Israel considered uh, Syria is their main adversary in, in that uh, in that context, and uh, uh, they decided to cooperate on a series of um, intelligence um, uh, intelligence cooperation, um, mainly main, and all, all security related uh, cooperation on Syria. But also, uh, this uh, alliance of the periphery included the, cur the the curves in northern Iraq, who also were at war with the uh, central Iraqi government and wanted to maintain their autonomy in northern Iraq. And uh, the lastly, it's Ethiopia, who also had um, uh, some conflict with Nasser Egypt. So, so the main factor which enabled this alliance of the periphery was um, common threat of Nasserism and Syria and um, the threat of uh, Pan-Arabism mm -hmm. was the main driver that enabled this uh, alliance of the periphery, which was not a formal alliance. It was more establishing close strategic relations with countries which were at odds with uh, with Nasser and, and Syria. And Israel at the time was surrounded by uh, uh, many Arab countries which wanted its destruction and replacement by uh, an Arab state. Therefore, it was natural for Israel to uh, establish as, as, uh, as many uh, alliances as possible, mm -hmm. partnerships as possible. Um, and in that uh, regards, Morocco could be interpreted as an extension of that um, alliance of the periphery as both countries, as I mentioned before, cooperated mm -hmm. in the field of security to uh, address a common uh, threat, which is, uh, mm -hmm. of course, as I mentioned, uh, Egypt and uh, Algeria. And it is still, in a way, today, the, the case, I mean, it's no longer the alliance of the periphery. It has been uh, reversed in a way because now the, the Arab states now are uh, aligned with Israel interest and Iran is, and Turkey are, I would say, uh, aligned with uh, 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 very much aligned against Israel at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's a reversal of the periphery doctrine. But uh, Morocco is indeed the major is major extension of that of, of that doctrine. It is, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I would say, a part of that uh, periphery doctrine. Okay, thank you very much for your <laughs> explanation for the wider uh, audience. I hope it and, helps. <laughs> uh, and in your in your paper, you you um, describe in great detail uh, the historical events during which Morocco provided a certain platform for negotiations between countries in conflict uh, or mm -hmm. facilitated and mediated their political uh, discussions. And you already mentioned that. And uh, namely, for example, the talks between Israel and Egypt during the 70s and the, the 80s, uh, also between the PLO and Israel that preceded uh, the, the Oslo Accords. And um, for what reason uh, or reasons that Morocco play this specific regional role and took uh, this role, we probably uh, always circle around the uh, security issues, etc. But maybe mm. there are many, many reasons. Well, I would say that um, the um, Arab-Israeli conflict was a factor of instability for uh, for Morocco, and Morocco always uh, expressed its desire to establish uh, peaceful relations with Israel and to facilitate uh, uh, formal um, Arab um, Israel, comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace, mm -hmm. as it was demonstrated by its effort to mediate between Egypt and Israel. 
they attempted to mediate between uh, the PLO and uh, Israel, but um, uh, this could not happen as Israel at the time was not uh, uh, keen to uh, to even talk to the PLO. The PLO at the time was considered as a terrorist organization, and they would only start talking uh, with the PLO during the uh, Oslo back channel negotiations. Mm -hmm. But uh, King Hassan uh, uh, was uh, convinced that uh, it should, the, the peace should be comprehensive and include all uh, actors in the region. The reason why uh, I would say yes, it's mainly because um, uh, um, terminate, terminating the Arab Israeli conflict would play would actually uh, bolster uh, Morocco's security and, uh, and national interest, and this is why they uh, uh, facilitated the, they facilitated talks between Israel and Egypt because if um, Egypt is removed from the Arab Israeli conflict, then a, co a wider comprehensive Arab Israeli war uh, would not no longer happen, and therefore. It, in my opinion, it, uh, it it definitely plays into uh, uh, Morocco's national interest to uh, to support mm -hmm. this peaceful uh, this peaceful uh, uh, outcome of uh, uh, of the negotiations. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. Uh, I'm curious how this conflict, uh, namely, influenced the relations between Israel and Morocco, and uh, why probably how openly supported is uh, Morocco towards uh, Palestine and uh, what has been the Morocco's stance uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict over the years and maybe um, how the, for example, intifadas uh, influenced the relationship? This is actually a very good question. Um, in um, uh, um, King Hassan actually always tried to balance uh, relations between Israel um, and, uh, and the PLO. Um, due to the fact that um, King Hassan was bound to the uh, commitment that uh, Morocco made in the uh, Rabat summit of 1974, uh, which support the PLO as, uh, which crowned the PLO role as the sole uh, representative of the Palestinian people. Um, but at the same time, King Hassan understood that the PLO constituted a, th a threat to both Israel and Jordan security, and thought that it should be solved, but with the, with, within the pan-Arab context, that the Arab state should solve the, um, the Palestinian issue. And this is actually, this was uh, King Hassan's position in 1977. So, and later on, uh, King Hassan, given his commitment to the first summit, uh, that uh, re reiterated his, uh, the Morocco's commitment and the Arab League commitment to uh, um, to um, um, uh, to come to, uh, to 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 ground the PLO role as uh, um, um, the Palestinian sole representative of the of the Palestinian people. Uh, King Hassan tried to convince both Shimon Peres and uh, Itzhak Shamir that um, it was necessary to talk to the PLO and push uh, both leaders to, to do so. But um, both Peres at the time and, and more, uh, uh, more specifically Shamir refused to uh, talk to the PLO to even negotiate with the PLO as it was considered a terrorist organization by mm -hmm. Israel. Uh, but later on during the Oslo Accords, uh, King Hassan uh, tried to uh, facilitate a little bit between um, uh, Israel and, uh, and the PLO, but he always had this realistic view that the PLO would not get what they want. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, uh, King Hassan stated that uh, the, 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 the Palestinians will not get all of East Jerusalem, but only a small portion of it, and that they should be realistic about it. Um, and... Um, um, when Rabin visit uh, shortly after the signing of the uh, Oslo Accords, visited he visited uh, King Hassan and uh, asked for his advice on how to um, how to actually uh, start a rapprochement with uh, with the Arab states and how to normalize relations with the Arab states. So mm -hmm. um, it was always a balance uh, between uh, the need for to maintain ties with Israel, but at the same time to. Uh, upheld its commitment as um, uh, in support for the PLO uh, and the uh, uh, the Arab position in the Arab Israeli conflict, um, and unfortunately, it was underscored by uh, the severance of relations in uh, October 2000, when uh, Morocco uh, decided to freeze diplomatic relations with Israel. This underscored uh, Morocco's commitment to the um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, so it played a role. Uh, in Moroccan foreign policy, it's uh, mm -hmm. it influenced a um, uh, significant part of uh, Moroccan foreign policy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, 
just staying with this uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you, uh, in your paper, you, you basically argue that based on the past experiences, Morocco could in the future play a substantially important role of a mediator or facilitator for future negotiations about, for example, the status quo of Jerusalem uh, mm -hmm. between Israeli and Palestinian authorities. And uh, could you maybe please elaborate on that? Because do you think that the public, whether Palestinian or Israeli, sees really Morocco as such a potential uh, mediator? Mm -hmm. uh, well, in my um, even in my PhD thesis, I um, posited that one of the re one of the reason um, final status negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians failed is due to a lack of regional involvement on uh, particularly on the issue of the holy sites in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned Morocco, but also Jordan. Uh, for instance, Jordan um, under Article Nine of the Israeli Jordanian Peace Treaty should be. Um, given high priority, Jordanian role in um, in the in this negotiation should be given high priority when fin when uh, these negotiations will take place. Uh, and Morocco was designated by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation uh, Al Quds Committee as um, uh, the guarantor or uh, mm -hmm. uh, or custodian of the uh, holy shrines in Jerusalem in 1975. And given the fact that both Morocco have relations with, with both Israel and the PA they could um, perhaps facilitate or fill the gaps between the two parties. Um, and um, so this is why I talk about this wider regional involvement that Morocco could um, uh, could, could actually uh, uh, facilitate uh, a, a more positive, uh, more uh, concu uh, conducive outcome mm -hmm. on, the, on the issue of the holy sites in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, along with with Jordan, this is uh, this is uh, I mean, this is a very very complex issues and past of negotiations course. have uh, led to uh, to a failure because both sides uh, negotiated bilaterally. But if um, it, if these uh, negotiations would have been conducted in a more uh, multi multilateral multilateral or regional uh, framework, then uh, I, I do believe that the the outcome uh, of uh, these negotiations would have been more successful. Mm -hmm. And were some concrete steps already uh, taken uh, in these negotiations? Like, what uh, did Morocco already played some role in negotiations about the holy sites? Not that I know. Most all of the negotiations were conducted uh, bilaterally. At some point during the negotiations in the Annapolis process, uh, Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Olmert proposed that the holy basin, which encompassed the old city and its surrounding area, would mm -hmm. be administered by um, a consortium of five nations, including Jordan, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, future Palestinian state, Israel. Uh, but Morocco wasn't included. This is, uh, but I believe that Morocco could potentially take part in such a solution if the two sides resume negotiations and in, and other actors are involved in the negotiations and they decide to recreate this kind of special regime for the old city and the old and its uh, old basin. Then I believe that Morocco could play a role then uh, in. Mm -hmm. That uh, endeavor, but at the moment, no. Unfortunately, there are no uh, Moroccan involvement in this in these negotiations, given the fact that there are no uh, negotiations on finance status issues yeah. at, at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and do you see uh, the role uh, or position and diplomatic relations with other countries uh, of Morocco in the region as unique or somehow maybe outstanding? Is there any? Uh, country with which it can be compared in any way and maybe we right now are moving mm. a bit to uh, your uh, another paper exactly <laughs> this is actually uh, the question I was uh, 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 I was uh, hoping that uh, uh, to, to get you will and, get <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Yes, actually, um, the, uh, there, there is actually a similar case of uh, special relations that were established between Israel and an Arab state, and that is Oman in 1975. So um, Israel and the Sultanate of Oman established clandestine ties in light of, um, uh, of um, a Marxist uh, when, when um, Oman was facing a Marxist rebellion in, in uh, 1975 and they requested Israeli assistance to curb that um, uh, insurrection. Israel provided uh, military support in the form of um, advisory groups uh, the, uh, and the Mossad actually also played a role in establishing these uh, security relations with, uh, with Oman. Mm -hmm. 
Um, much like Morocco, Oman was always supportive of every um, uh, Arab-Israeli agreement. For instance, they supported the, the Camp David Accords in 1978 and the Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. And it was one of the only three Arab countries which did not have a diplomatic relations with Egypt once um, they have been uh, expelled from the Arab League after the um, mm -hmm. uh, Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Um, and all the Arab states have severed diplomatic relations, but Oman, Morocco, and Sudan um, kept uh, diplomatic relations with Egypt. Mm -hmm. And Oman always supported every single um, Arab-Israeli agreement uh, from the Ken David Accords up until the, uh, the uh, Abraham Accords. Uh, Oman also established partial diplomatic relations, much like uh, Morocco in 1995, oh, no, sorry, 1994. And they also played a major role in the Madrid multilateral negotiations, especially on water desalinization. Um, the, um, the only water desalinization uh, Middle East Research, Research Center is located in Muscat, and it is still active and serves as a venue of um, talks between Israeli and uh, Omani officials. Two Israeli prime ministers visited Oman, not even three actually, um, sorry, Netanyahu visited also in, in 2018. So three Israeli prime ministers visited uh, Muscat. Um, in, in 1994, 1996, I've been in Paris, but more recently, um, um, it's like uh, sorry, Benjamin Netanyahu visited uh, Oman in October 2018. And what is also uh, unique in that relationship is that Oman also maintained ties with Iran. It is not part mm -hmm. of the uh, uh, of the anti Iranian coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, which include Israel, the Gulf states, most of the Gulf states. Uh, many UAE, uh, UAE, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia, but Oman maintained actually that relationship with uh, Iran and even mediated talks between the United States um, and Iran when they were negotiating uh, um, uh, the, Iran the interim agreements on uh, the Iranian nuclear program. Muscat played a role in that uh, in his negotiations. So uh, Oman and Morocco case are, have many, many sim have many similarities, many mm -hmm. things in common. This is why actually I uh, I decided to write two papers, one on Morocco, Israel relations, mm -hmm. and one on Oman Israel relations mm -hmm. to underscore the similarities. And uh, can can you can you predict uh, whether Oman together with Morocco and Jordan could be also a potential mediator for um, the issue of the holy sites, as you mentioned? Um, I'm not sure about uh, that Oman could play a role in this, um, in the status of Jerusalem, for instance, but they could play a role in, when it comes to uh, multilateral negotiations, mm -hmm. for instance, on water, uh, on the issue of water. Uh, so they could definitely, definitely mediate between the PA and Israel in his, um, in his negotiations uh, on, on the issue of water, which were also uh, addressed during final status negotiations. Uh, but not on the holy sites or uh, or or um, these uh, highly complex issues. I believe that Morocco, given the fact that they have been uh, granted a special role by the OIC, yeah. given the uh, the ability and the fact that they also have both good relations with Israel and the PA, something they share with uh, Oman, but uh, they can play a role in this uh, in uh, on the issue of Jerusalem. Oman will play a role in. A more functional uh, on the more functional issues such yeah, as yeah, the yeah, uh, yeah. water desalinization, perhaps other issues as well, which uh, pertain to the uh, multi multilateral dimension. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, back if we go back to uh, Israel Morocco uh, relation, um, maybe could you describe what's the current situation, uh, especially after Morocco joined the yeah. Abraham Accords in 2020 and maybe briefly what Abraham Accords meant for the region so far? Yes. So first of all, the Abraham Accords is indeed a game changer for the region as it is the first um, uh, normalization that took place between Israel and the Arab states since uh, um, uh, since the um, signing of the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan. And to a lesser extent, when Israel established partial diplomatic relations with Morocco, uh, Oman, and Qatar and Tunisia in uh, in, the, in uh, during the Oslo process in the 1990s, this is a major game changer. Uh, as in the past, the Arab states uh, uh, stated that they will not normalize relations with Israel unless Israel may make uh, significant progress in the peace process. The official Arab position have been the Arab Peace Initiative that Israel should withdraw from all the territories with minor swaps 
uh, and that and that there should be a two uh, two binational capital in East, in Jerusalem, East Jerusalem for the Palestinians and West Jerusalem for Israel, and then. When all these outstanding issues have been resolved, the Arab states would be willing to uh, to enter into peace with Israel and normalize relations. The fact that um, the UAE and and Bahrain, as well as Morocco and to a lesser extent Sudan, agreed to normalize relations before um, a final status a final status agreement have been uh, concluded is, is indeed a, ma a major shift in uh, uh, Arab policy in the region. Uh, nevertheless, still some Arab states. Uh, maintain their official dogmatic position, mainly Saudi Arabia, but also most of the Arab states state that they will not normalize relations unless Israel uh, withdrew from the territories. Oman, even though they have um, uh, special bonds, with special relations with Israel, still uh, maintain the position as well. Uh, now for Morocco, it has been uh, a game, uh, a major, major uh, uh, shift in terms of uh, uh, security cooperation between the two countries, as Benny Gantz, for instance, recently visited Morocco to sign a series of um, defense agreements related to cyber uh, security, but also um, Israel committed to upgrade um, the fleet of F-5E, uh, which is an uh, old and aging fighter jets of the Moroccan Air Force. Uh, so Israel committed to fully upgrade its uh, avionics and uh, weapon systems and electronic warfare suits, as well as provide um, uh, advanced UAVs to the uh, to the Moroccan uh, military. So this is uh, something that is not necessarily unprecedented, but the fact that it has been officialized is uh, is significant, and it's uh, it is an, indeed uh, a game changer in the region. It will bolster relations on uh, between the two, two countries on so many levels, not just the security levels, but in terms of academia, in terms of tourism, economics, sure. trade is actually uh, booming. Uh, tourism is booming. There are no direct flights, which did not happen uh, when Israel partially uh, established partial diplomatic relations with, with Morocco. Now, the direct flights uh, were inaugurated between uh, uh, Morocco and Israel. So this, I believe, was uh, is uh, something that is um, that is un unprecedented and uh, will lead to, uh, I believe, a comprehensive peace uh, between Israel and the Arab states in in, in the near future. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I think that we are, uh, I would have uh, more questions, of course, especially, uh, for example, about this comparison of Morocco and Oman, but maybe for uh, another, we will leave this for another interview in the in the future. And mm -hmm. uh, I wish you a great academic career and fingers crossed for all your uh, publications and papers in the future. Uh, we are very, very happy that you participated uh, and uh, that you gave us your insight to the very complex issues of uh, Morocco-Israeli relations. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, I very, very appreciate the, uh, very much appreciate the, this opportunity to, uh, to, to talk about this paper and I'm very, very grateful for this, uh, for this amazing opportunity. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> And uh, also, I would like to thank uh, to our listeners, to our audience, uh, and if you are uh, interested in the upcoming interviews and events, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, or you can uh, give us a follow on social media, specifically Facebook and Twitter. Thank you again, and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.